you know who I am, but who are you? Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. And with that scene, you have the setup for one of the most iconic uh, action films, definitely of the 1980s. And uh, a film that, that many people call the greatest action film ever made. I don't know if, the, if that is exactly true. I don't know if, um, if that hits it on the head. But I will say this much, that the character of John McClane, 40, 40 years later, is easily iconic. It's um, well, 30, some, 30 some odd years later. It's iconic. It's a uh, part of the fabric of, of American action cinema. And it's, it was definitely in 1987, a, um, a rather abrupt left turn to what we were used to as far as action films were concerned. So this week, let's dive into John, McTier John McTiernan's Die Hard. Mr. Chavez, what are your recollections on this film? We were um, we were talking about Bruce Willis, um, and I, I this isn't one that I really saw a lot. Um, I saw it enough, and I uh, I got to hear the is this a Christmas movie? Is it's not a fucking Christmas movie? Mm -hmm. um, I know you're like it's not a Christmas movie. Um, I personally don't give a shit um <laughs> but it's like what the fuck is it is it a christmas movie or is it like it just takes place during christmas what does that even mean um but of the of the well first of all of the john mctiernan uh films notably this one predator mm -hmm. hunt for red october mm -hmm. um those are kind of the the probably his big three i know he did he did the, the die hard with a vengeance he did last action hero mm -hmm. some other ones um predator i think is the one that for me was more um present even more than this even though I think, I mean, if we go back to 80s action, we've got built even into this, into that iconic uh, exchange between Alan Rickman's character and Bruce Willis's John McClane. You've got this, what you talk about, what you said, the American is fabric of action. So John Wayne, obviously from before, Marshall Dillon, Gunsmoke. Um, but 80s, First Blood and Rambo 2, First Blood, whatever the fuck, whatever confusing title that is. Rambo, um, First Blood, Part 2. Part 2, yeah. <laughs> and then Rambo um, 3, yeah. Um, Rambo, Second Blood, Part 3. Yeah. Um, so Stallone, you've got Terminator in 84, you've got Predator 87, so James Cameron and John McTiernan, respectively, with with uh, uh, Schwarzenegger. Um, you've got those, those, it was like, those were out there, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, they were just as out there as when we talked about this a few weeks ago, you know, they were right there with Hulk Hogan. Um, Oh, yeah. Buff. Um, too buff, too oily in comparison to this. So it was kind of like, okay, these are like otherworldly um, characters. You also had like Indiana Jones, who was more of a, like an everyman um, 
Raiders is, is early 80s, what, 80, 81? Temple of Doom is probably around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Temple of Doom's like 84, maybe mm-hmm. 83. Yeah. Um, he's on every man, Harrison Ford, but at the same time, um, maybe too specific. I don't know, too, too, too archaeological, too, I don't know what. Bruce Willis is more of that every man. Um, John McClane is a cop. So already a unique thing for me, my, my, I, the stuff that would be on TV that I would like tune in or kind of like pause from flipping the channel. I don't even think I had a remote control back then yet. Um, it was like actually the turning dial the back dial. Then? Wow. Oh yeah. The <laughs> dial and the fucking the magic touch on the fucking antenna. I had oh, that touch. I remember the touch. Everybody had it, but but supposedly they were the only ones. Um, and you know, you you squeeze. You don't even squeeze. You just put your two fingers on the antenna, and it's like perfect. But if you let it go, it sucks. Um, so there was that, and you know, one broken antenna, and all of it. Uh, yeah, the good old days. <laughs> the good old fucking days. Um, when if you don't have the remote control, it's kind of like you change it. No, you change it. Um, mm-hmm. When you're not clap on, clap off the clapper with the lights, you know? Um, so, yeah, for me, Predator was around more and Terminator for sure. Um, but John McClane was off to the side with the grin, the smirk, the smart ass remark. Um, waiting to be rented, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it was there too. It just wasn't uh, for me in my in my. Uh, it wasn't in my rotation as much as as uh, for sure Terminator and and maybe uh, Predator secondarily, um, but definitely Die Hard was. Uh, that's what I thought of. Um, that's what I came to think of Bruce Willis after. <clears throat> because for me, Bruce Willis was moonlighting mm-hmm. as a kid. That was, that was, and I was a kid. Um, and I don't know why, I mean, it was, this also makes sense in the generation as to why mom would like allow me to watch that show. But, um, she was just kind of like, that show is so stupid. The show is stupid. Why do you like it? Um, you know, I think I it's, it's I weird. Know. I think it's weird. We put a lot of emphasis on what our parents let us watch when in reality, I don't really think they knew what we were watching or or really cared at certain points. I mean, I've, right. I've talked to my mom yeah. about this and and she, my mom will tell you uh, very strongly, she had no idea I was watching Richard Pryor. She said she didn't know. And I was like, how the fuck could you not know? There was one big TV in the house. It was the one with cable. That's where it was coming on. You could see me watching this guy on stage saying this wild shit. How did you not know? Yeah, you could hear it through the house. You could hear him talking about the ridiculousness that he was. um, And so, like, like, um, you watching... The difference is with you watching Moonlighting is kind of like um, kind of like me watching the Golden Girls and a lot of other shit like that. In the same respect as like, why would why would two um, preteens be so captivated by these stories that were so far out of our um, our wheelhouse? This is shit that we had no understanding of or place. It's like, like, were, were you a junior detective? Did you, <laughs> did you work with a fucking model trying to figure out these weird cases? And I, if I remember Moonlighting correctly, it was a detective show, but it was a tongue-in-cheek detective show that played with genre. Am I right? Is that is that the way it was? I mean, or do you even I, remember I, it? That, that sounds. I mean, that sounds right. <laughs> and it was like, and from now, like. Uh, trying to think back on it and i remember it was that it was the alter Roll music mm-hmm. um and they they would just like have these quips back and forth and yeah they were like these late night like uh 
private eyes um and they have this like chemistry mm-hmm. and that's really i think what i what um yeah, now, now i want to go i want to and i didn't do it for the show but i want to i want to kind of watch an episode or some of an episode good luck um, because it's hard to find it's a hard show to find but i'm sure there's clips on youtube mm-hmm. um yeah um and I just kind of remember them being like smart ass back mm-hmm. and forth to each other. Yeah. Um, and my mom thought it was like dumb. Um, and I don't remember the time slot, but I know it was at night. Um, and I don't know what day it came out. I think it was on channel seven vaguely, it was ABC. Um, which ABC for mm-hmm. us, it's channel seven. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I don't know. That, that to me that was Bruce Willis. So then it was like, okay, Die Hard, and then from that to me it jumps to Pulp Fiction. After that, you know what I mean? Like a few years later. Oh, you jump, You make a big leap. That's a big leap. What's What's in between? Well, in between was his bid for um, kind of respectability. He would do a film called In Country where he was a Vietnam vet. It was a pretty good performance. Um, he would do Hudson Hawk, which would almost tank him. I think uh, Hudson Hawk. That that's the he's a thief, right? Yeah, he's a it's it's a it was a tongue in cheek kind of old Hollywood musical kind of thing, and Bruce Willis made the mistake of always believing that he was musical. Um, so <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> he he had that uh, he had that delusion playing the harmonica, and um, oh yeah, um, he was like in some kind of band or whatever. Yeah, but something. He released an album called The Return of Bruno or some shit like that. It was supposedly horrible. Um, but it was it was really he became he became the regular man action star of the late eighties, early nineties, because like you said, you you um action films up until that point, or at least uh throughout the eighties were it was a it was a battle between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, muscled up, oiled, um, ridiculous yeah. physiques. I mean, you remember we were talking about Rocky, the difference between right. Rocky, Stallone and Rocky versus Rocky Three, where he was down to something like 2% body fat and completely unrealistic uh, fighter. But also you had um, you had the emergence of, of home video and you had um, Chuck Norris, Grabbing a hold of that yeah, market, Dolph Lundgren and all Dolph, those guys. Yeah, uh, guys like Jeff Speakman, um, a lot of lot of uh, uh, yeah, American Ninja, all that shit. All like that, that shit. yeah, Michael, Michael, all of yeah. that shit, all of that shit. But but I think like him or dislike him because the stories on Bruce Willis are are legion. There's just there's just so many stories of him being a prick, but also him being a great guy. Worked. And he was married to Demi Moore, and and he was married to Demi. That Moore. was part of it too. Mm-hmm. That was there was something. Mom used to get Star Magazine, oh, okay. and um, and it was like, and it wasn't glossy in the early days. And I'm completely hijacking your mm-hmm. no no please. analysis here. Um, <laughs> well, I just I'm just being I'm just talking about old old times. I'm I'm not even giving a fuck about this episode. Um, it, it's it used to be it was like. Like newspaper texture, mm-hmm. the paper. I remember those. Um, remember that? And, yeah. And they used to have these uh, sections, and I, I used to flip through them, and um, because I was always looking at things that I had no concept of. Um, and yeah, they used to have all these pictures of like, you know, people on the red carpet and all that bullshit, and and because that's all what it was about, and all these pictures of the me more. And it, and it was also like, oh, like, um, and then thinking like, okay, Demi Moore is this person, like this movie or, you know, these, um, these, uh, like St. Elmo's Fire mm-hmm. things or whatever. Um, that Brad Pack era. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and he's married to her. And, and, um, and so it was like, it, it was, that was part of the, the persona of Bruce Willis. And then, and then now that I'm thinking about it, fucking, he's in, um, I think he's the voice, right? And look who's talking. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he was. Which, 
was silly. You know what I mean? But um, but that was another in country I never saw. Um, it was good. It was a Norma but, Jewison film. They were trying to push a young English actress named Emily. I can't remember her last name, but she was. She did a film with Peter Falk called Cookie, and this film I don't, I don't know what it, Emily Cook maybe I don't remember. Anyway. Yeah, and and I think probably um, obviously there was Look Who's Talking too. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not I don't remember exactly what else was in in that gap between. Well, there was the last um, the last Boy Scout teamed him up with uh, Damon Wayans, a Shane a Shane Black script when Shane Black was huge. Um, I don't know that one. You've never seen The Last Boy Scout? Last Boy Scout is a Tony Scott film. Um, have really misogynistic in some regards. I remember they, they were talking about, um, I know, uh, uh, what's his name? Roger Ebert came down on it pretty hard. Um, but it was... Uh, I mean, but he's he's the last fucking Boy Scout, Roger Ebert. So yeah, it's kind of like, okay. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> but like... Uh, kind of like, okay. You fucking had to shoes, huh? Pretty much, although... A drunk so you know that's another story anyway um he was <laughs> <laughs> this was a weird period there was um oh my god it was uh the last boy scout 91 there was um i know he did uh 12 monkeys probably 97 somewhere around there uh but it was it yeah, was, that the was era yeah of, that was later yeah but it was the era of die hard his uh fifth element the fifth element yeah the basan film that's, yeah that's that's post pulp fiction stuff Mm -hmm. But he had done, they, they didn't know really what to do with him because his first film was called Blind Date. It was a Blake Edwards romantic comedy with Kim Basinger and I believe it was John Larroquette. And um, it was about a, a guy who goes on a blind date and the girl goes completely batshit when she has a drink. Like she has like, she has like a, a, an allergic reaction. She's allergic to alcohol basically. And it's like the worst blind date ever. He did a film following that called Sunset where he was a... He was a silent movie star, um, probably the biggest, the biggest movie star of the time. And um, I think he was playing a character based on a real life person that James Garner in the same film was playing. So I don't remember what the film did, but that's the, the, the fact that those two films did, Blind Date did moderately well, Sunset died. And moonlighting was this TV thing. And this is at a time when people didn't necessarily move that easily from television to um, the big screen. But everybody had turned down Die Hard. At, at the time, it was called Nothing Lasts Forever. It was a, it was a book that was uh, written by a guy named Roderick Thorpe, I think his name was. And um, it was originally, it was a sequel to another film called I don't know if the book was called, but the film was called The Detective with um, Frank Sinatra. And um, Sinatra's a detective, and uh, he was given, like, first rights. Sinatra had, by contract, he had to be offered the part. So there's a there's a weird world where Frank Sinatra could have played this character. But Sinatra wow. said, yeah, I know it's weird. Sinatra said, I'm too old and I'm too rich to want to do this shit. And he was. He was he was like sixty years old. He, there's no way that he could have played John McClane. Yeah, he would point. have fucking die hard in Palm Springs in some <laughs> exactly. fucking one story mid century fucking modern bullshit house. Exactly. I um, mean you, you just couldn't have done it. It wouldn't have been possible. But at the it time it look cool at night. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time the um the stars and the action film stars were Schwarzenegger who was moving into comedies at that point and didn't want to do it. Stallone, who I think he had done things that were too similar. He did, he wasn't interested or knowing Stallone, he probably wanted to rewrite the script. Um, probably, probably Nick Nolte, who Nick Nolte's, I would love to do an episode on Nick Nolte because that career is wild. <laughs> <laughs> Just the ups and downs of that crazy. Drake card. Oh yeah. <laughs> That alcoholic, crazy bastard uh, who I love. I just fucking love with all my heart. And I just, I want to love to see more movies with him. But um, these were some of the guys that they that they pushed for John McClane. And I think it was a power move by Bruce Willis's agents. 
because he was big on moonlighting he and they wanted to push him as an action they wanted to push him into into films and it made sense to put him in an action film but they lobbied so hard this is the kind of situation where if um if you make a big enough deal about something it's either going to die on the vine or it's going to be huge so mm -hmm. they made a really big deal. And I remember this. I remember this because I used to I used to watch Entertainment Tonight all the time. I used to I used to read those same magazines that your mom I can had. hear that song. Oh yeah. Da, 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 da. You know, boom. Yeah. Um, da, and, da, da, da. <laughs> Mary Hart and her million dollar insured legs, right. whatever bullshit that was. That era, remember? Um and and that and that fucking mook John Tesh standing up there doing doing their bullshit. But um I remember the report of they were going to pay Bruce Willis, who had never, who had never really headlined, who had never headlined an action film, and whose films before that were only moderate successes. Um, they paid him five million, which made him the highest paid actor of that time. So he exceeded Schwarzenegger. He exceeded Stallone, um, and it was a power move. But in doing so, they set it up for a huge fall, because when they started shooting the movie, and Bruce Willis was shooting this film at the same time as he was shooting Moonlighting, so he would like shoot Moonlighting in the day, and um, he would shoot Die Hard at night. It was kind of like what what Michael J. Fox did with um, Back to the Future. So you're thoroughly exhausted during this period. Because, but the idea was um, there was a break in, in moonlighting because Sybil Shepherd was pregnant during the last season. I, if I remember that show correctly, she left the show for a short period, not leaving the show, but she had a side story where she married some guy which took her out of the office and made it easier for them to... The, 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 the show was on life support for like the last one and a half seasons or whatever, because it was like, I, I don't think they were prepared for, they didn't have an end game for that story. And they took chances that didn't pay off pain and thus painted themselves in corners that they couldn't get out of. That's what I remember of that show. I used to watch that show as well. Um, so Bruce Willis had this like 11 week period where he could, he could shoot this movie, but he also had to, it, it wasn't like he had a completely free time of moonlighting, but he had he had more free time to do it. Anyway, it worked out. He shot this thing. But when they showed it in previews and people saw Bruce Willis, people immediately started to laugh because they were just used to him as a comic. They weren't used to him as... He wasn't the Bruce Willis that he would become. Yeah. And it's hard, it's hard in 2024 to get your... to wrap your mind around that because Bruce Willis has been... I know you said that that uh, at this point he's not. Um, I don't know. There was a point there where Bruce Willis was huge, and then now, uh, I think you're probably right. It would be kind of hard to find people who who can relate to to how big that was. And I, but I also think that like. Today's generation, and I'm not talking about the younger. I'm just talking about people movie watching people in general don't have a very good handle or an understanding of what has come before. I think, I think there's a, I think there's a, there's a, there's a collective cultural amnesia that goes with every generation that doesn't, they don't, um, they don't embrace the history of film the way we did, where we, you know, um, whereas we were watching, where we were watching these action films. If you were watching first blood or ramble like you, you brought up earlier, you couldn't help but think about at least Apocalypse Now. You know what I mean? Yeah, you had a sense of mm -hmm. yeah, you yeah. had a sense of this like trajectory of, of, yes. of, yes. of and you thought of it in terms of like yeah, like you could see like there were lateral films. It was like if you're mm -hmm. watching something especially mid eighties mm -hmm. and let's say not as it's coming out, because let's say someone like me, um at that point I was still too young but let's yeah. say all it takes is just a five more years so mm -hmm. by the time i'm 10 11 years old then it's like i'm like oh this came out five years ago this came out five years ago mm -hmm. um well okay like so there's some vietnam stuff going on like cool like um you know and then it becomes like what vietnam movie do, from 
five years ago do you want to watch this one or this one okay both right yeah. um you, you get an understanding of the lay of the land even though like it's it's uh you don't have the internet and, and it's still like happening sure and that's exactly i mean there, there, there was a certain literacy and an understand and an understanding of that trajectory that i think is pretty much lost at this point so um we're a couple of old guys remembering our youth and these films because i remember seeing this film in a theater i remember seeing it town and country probably the second or third theater after you after you pass the concession stands and i remember being like um i don't know what this is gonna be this guy is is david addison i think was his name on moonlighting and um he's he's gonna play this cop this New York cop. Um, but I already had, um, I had already seen most of the Stallone and Schwarzenegger films, which built them up to be, and, and not the, the Terminator, notwithstanding robotic. Mm. You know what I mean mm -hmm. by that? Where, where it's like superhuman. And what was really, I think what was brilliant about um, the John McClane character and what McTiernan did with it was this embracing of an everyman who not only was an everyman, but was a, an almost um, reluctant, not even almost, a reluctant hero. He did not want to be doing what he was doing. And there's a couple of points in the movie where he wants to just sit back and wait for the LAPD to handle it. Yeah. Which if you look at it, if you look at the situation, that's exactly the way you would handle that kind of thing. You, you know, you're up against formidable odds. Um, as moronic and stupid as this film is. And, and I gotta, I gotta say something as I was watching it, my relationship with you kind of ruined it for me. Because as I was watching it, all I could think of was how stupid you must feel this is. <laughs> and there was a part of me that felt sorry for you because I was like, he had to have seen this when he was a kid. Did he not get excited then? Was he just a miserable little eight-year-old, you know, drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes going, that's fucking stupid. <laughs> that's what I saw. Yeah, like by eight, I had already given up the, the gum, the cigarette gum, and, and I had a graduated up to. <laughs> I was a Marlboro kid. You, you were pulling um, off the filters and just saying, oh, fuck this. <laughs> yeah, with fucking my Folgers, you know, that was gourmet for me back then. It's the best part of waking up, you know? That's um, what I saw. That's what I was sitting there. I was sitting there making myself fucking laugh because I was like, Oh my god! And it, and it all, it all stems from talking about Face Off, and Con Air, and all this other yeah, ridiculousness that we've gone through. Because it's like I, I, I was like, wow! I just know. <laughs> I started to ask myself, did he? Does he have a sense of wonder? Does he? Does he? Is he? Was he willing to allow himself to buy out to the stupidity of this thing? Because it's, it's really a, um, it's not as stupid as those films. No, but you can not. see the found. Yeah, you can see the foundation. You can see the road that's being built that would eventually get you to Jerry Bruckheimer. Oh yeah, you know what sure. I mean. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. <laughs> and that is true. Um, but it's like, yeah, and then the, it put me back in the fucking eighties, and I'm like, remember, like I watched Moonlighting. Yeah. Um, and so. It's not like, you know, basically you heard me as my mom telling you this is stupid for <laughs> Die Hard, but it's like, um, no, this is an entertaining um, yeah. movie that, that even I hadn't seen it in, in, and it's not one of those ones that I'm like, I know every turn of the mm -hmm. fucking film. Yeah. And it had been long enough to where it was kind of like still, um, I was able to watch it again kind of in a new way. Um, pretty soon we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. That is not a film that will ever like. There's nothing about that film could, that could surprise me at this point. Yeah. Um, but that, but but it's still like 
something that I've wa- I've watched it so many times, but I will continue to watch it so many fucking times and not get tired of it. Mm-hmm. And and I don't I uh, I space it out, you know what I mean, for that purpose as well. Yeah. But um, so Die Hard isn't um, it isn't one that I'm just kind of like. And then yes, I had fun with fucking the Nicolas Cage trilogy of um. Of stupidity, of, of ridiculous of stupidity <laughs> with fucking the rock on air and face off. Um, but it was fun. But this, I think, is more fun. Um, mm-hmm. because I think, um, it is, it, it has its, and, and again, remember that, like, uh, I believe that there must be, um, Jim Jarmusch says, says about, bands and musicians there has to be just enough of like and i'm super paraphrasing it but it, there has to be just enough of a sense of like the ridiculous to yeah. it in order for it to be really complete and cool um and i i think action is inherently that way too like action the a- action as a genre is like it has to be somewhat stupid mm-hmm. um and i don't mean stupid in terms of like the intelligence level or whatever. Um, it's just kind of like, there has to be enough ridiculous, enough ridiculousness for, um, for one to like, say like, yeah, sure. Um, Mm -hmm. but that's what makes it like not a documentary. It's an action fucking thing. I agree Um, with that. But I would also add to it that it has to be true to the world and the and the physics that that the story creates. So, like what I say, well, that it has is, to defy our physics on some level, but it still has to have the internal logic. Exactly. Of its, own. it's, it's yeah. in the weird way. It's kind of like a Roadrunner cartoon. Um, the, the, you're going to see wild shit, but within the context of the story that's being told is jumping off a building tied to a fire hose as it explodes behind you. Uh, not realistic, but believable. And yeah, in the context right. of this film, it is. Right. You not know what realistic, I mean? but believable is I think that's the, I think that's the golden rule. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also action. so like the thing about the film, and I think the film what the film gets right and does right in the first film, because there are five films in this series. The fifth one being a film that I don't even count. I, I would like to pretend that the what fifth film doesn't even count. What are they called? It's Die Hard, it's, Die Hard Two. No, Die what, Hard, Die Harder, right? It's Die Hard, Die Hard Two, Die Harder. The colon. Uh-huh. Then it's called um, Live Free or Die Hard. And then, um, oh, that's the all American one. Uh-huh. No, 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 no. There's Die Hard with a Vengeance. That's the Sam Jackson one with, um, with, uh, uh, uh the great Jeremy Irons as, as Alan Rickman's brother. Um, oh, that's, yeah. See, I don't even, I don't, uh, that's yeah. Die Hard with a Vengeance. Die Hard with a Vengeance. That's, uh, John McTiernan's return. Once, but yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, that's live, cool. yeah, Live Free or Die Hard. And, Live Free or Die Hard, which is a film that I really enjoy. I mean, I I know I'm in the minority on this one. I really like that film, but it is completely moronic. And a friend of mine, a friend of mine once said, it's insane that in the first, in by the last film, he's superhuman, jumping from a jumping from a a, a semi truck as it at, jumping off of a semi truck on a freeway overpass onto a, a jet, a hovering jet and hanging off of that shit. That's his superhuman. That, that by that point, John McClane, 20 some odd years later is superhuman compared to the first film where his kryptonite is broken glass. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how do you, how do you trend, you know, so this is a film, this is a film series that by the end of it, has no regard or um, or respect for the parameters that have been set up. So it, it's very easy to see how this film could, how the film series could diminish in quality and rob the character and the original film of its of its um, of its power. Um, 
but yeah, it broke the rule. It did. It did. And but I enjoy it. And I remember watching it screaming in the theater because I like I like really moronic shit. I like when they take it to such an extreme, ridiculous level that I'm sitting there going, give me a fucking break. And the last the, the, the fourth film does that. The fourth film does that in spades. It's unbelievable how how moronic it is. There's a point where they're 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 running through a tunnel. Uh like an eight lane car tunnel in New York or not New York. It's, I don't, I think they're in Washington or Virginia. So I don't know where the fuck they are, but, uh, the lights are out. You got traffic coming both ways. They're running and there's, there are two cars that they run between another car gets hit, flies over. And Justin Long and, and Bruce Willis duck between these two cars and it lands right above them. Like like it lands on the like it lands as a roof to these two cars. It's fucking moronic. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, like a Stonehenge type yeah. of thing. Yeah, exactly. And I remember just laughing my ass off because I said to myself, Well, this is where they're going with this. Okay, it's fun. But the thing about the die hard movies that all of them did well up until um up until the fifth one. They all had great villains. They really had formidable, interesting villains. None, none as well as well written or well acted as um, Alan Rickman's turn as Hans Gruber. But uh, Timothy Oliphant in the last film was a lot of fun. Um, William William Sadler. In the second film, John, William Sadler and John Amos were a lot of fun. And um, what's his name? Jeremy Irons, Jeremy in, Irons. The, in the third film. All of them really good. But <clears throat> I don't think, I think, I think that um, Bruce Willis owes his career to Alan Rickman. Because if Rickman hadn't been in this film, I don't know of another actor that could have brought the level of... Um, refinement yeah he was very sophisticated he was very, um, and he, they, they could yeah they consider him one of the great villains in all the movies um obviously he's not gonna supplant uh darth vader which is i think it's i wasn't it between darth vader and the wicked witch of the west that were like the number one and number two back and forth those are the two uh, greatest probably. yeah uh, that sounds similar yeah. and even when we were when we did our version of that mm-hmm. um, yeah one of us picked one and the other picked the other right Something like that. Yeah. yeah. I think that was, I think that's where, um, what we did with it. Um, but Rickman's character and, and for, to McTiernan's credit, he turned this film down a number of times because he said, and this is a quote, terrorists are not likable. Terrorists are not likable, but robbers are a lot of fun. And I think it really does. I think it really does work in this film because, for them to be terrorists, you would have, you would have just written that off. But robbers, thieves, that shit is exciting and fun. And there's a, it, it, it transforms the entire, um, the entire power of the scheme itself, the setup. The, how they're planning this, uh, uh, the idea, and it really makes sense because because Rickman says, if you steal six hundred dollars, you can disappear. If you steal six hundred million, they're going to find you unless they think you're dead. Yeah, and he he has such a um, I don't know if it's the British thing because there there are untold numbers of instances where British actors play. Um, play either the villain yeah they either play the villain or they play an american villain and they they add a gravita to it that that american actors don't normally bring to it yeah classical training yeah and you know before this he had never made a film he had never been in any film and they um they liked him off of a performance that he did I, i don't know if it was broadway or if it was in London, but he played the Malkovich part on stage of uh, Dangerous Liaisons. Mm-hmm. 
And if you've ever seen Dangerous Liaisons, that's a that's a pretty powerful um, character. So you you have this kind of dangerous sexiness, and Rickman has that in this film, and it's kind of weird because he's like forty in this movie, but he looks. Um, he doesn't look young. Well, he looks young compared to the Rickman that we would come to know. Um, but he's he's thin. He's well he's well coiffed, you know. He's in that suit, yeah. and he demands respect. And when you see him in this film, you you think to yourself, "There's never a moment, at least for me, there's never a moment in this film, watching Rickman, where I don't think he's Hans Gruber." He's capable of masterminding this plan. And if things had worked out a little bit differently, he would have got away with this shit. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the, he does have that kind of like Valmont mm -hmm. um, from Dangerous Liaisons, this um, on the one hand, predator, predatory, I guess, mm -hmm. not just predator, but predatory. Um, but also there is, yeah, there's an element of like, um, a refinement, a, a kind of sexuality, um, that isn't like, it's not that he's sexual. It's just that you feel that he's someone who is, is sensual. Mm -hmm. Someone who's like, he's going to fucking, uh, He's going to rob the world, but as he's robbing the world, he's going to have a fucking a cognac and a cigar and and stop and try to seduce some some someone's wife and um, and and run off with the money. And, and he's not even going to laugh about it. He's just going to smile. Yeah. Um, he plays this German criminal. Um He's a great foil to Bruce Willis's New York fucking down to earth um, American vibe. Um, he's playing it with all the subtext. There's a lot more humor. There's humor, but he's not um, over the top. It's 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 all below the surface. Um, Alan Rickman, and that's the thing too. It's like if it would have been. A terrorist is just another version of a fucking, like, an updated Bond villain. Yes. Um, and I was so thinking that about guy it, was, he would have been a great Bond villain, but he's so much better as this. It, in some ways, because yeah. Bond villains are superhuman. They're, they're evil geniuses. This is a humanist. This is a, this is a, a genius human. Yeah. This is, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And he's always, he's... Uh, He's so about the mission, but he's still, he's confident throughout. He, um, things are going wrong. Everyone around him is becoming more and more emotional. Mm -hmm. He's for the most part, staying cool. You can see him, uh, thinking, but he's like, I know this is going to work because I fucking planned this. I know it's going to work because I fucking planned it. Even to when, he, to the point where he, 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 he pretends to be an American hostage. That's a great scene. In yeah. the bank. And you can see his, his thought process. You can see him pretending. You can see everything in it. And it's utterly believable. You know, even the, the everything going wrong, the coincidences, all of it is, is believable. Um, and he makes it look easy. He makes it all look fucking easy. That that's uh, that's very difficult to be in an action film, to be a villain who I, at no point did I, even though you imagined me to be thinking it, at no point was I was like, <laughs> at no point was I saying to myself, "This is so fucking stupid." Alan Rickman is that so yeah. stupid, stupid, stupid? <laughs> Nothing. I was just like, it, I was enjoying it, and yeah. and um, and. The the humor. I mean, there's a little bit of a lot. Well, there's a lot of bit of fucking exposition that's kind of like okay, and then the setup that he fucking going back to Bruce Willis that he happens to be 
you know, he has this marital thing going on with his wife and he happens to be in that building. And um, it's kind of a little bit like, okay, sure. Like, yeah. Um, but that's, you kind of, you buy into it and it's like, okay, um, fine. Um, I get it. Let's do this, you know? Um, yeah. Let's have some fun. It's that let's sense, have some yeah. fun suspension of disbelief that we're going to have fun we're going to watch how moronic this is and we're going to just we're just going to enjoy it yeah we're just going to fucking enjoy it trying to get broke try not to get broken glass all over ourselves <laughs> uh bonnie bedelia great oh, in kind wonderful. of in that in that um I, I always remember her from needful things um which uh would come out a few years later mm -hmm. um because I'm, I, that's another one that was like, I wore that fucking tape out. Um, Max von Sydow playing the devil. Um, Perfect casting. But you can't do better than that. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. Um, Alan Rickman. Um, the uh, Family Matters. Uh, what's his name? Reginald um, Bell Johnson. Reginald Bell Johnson. Um, you know, that's another throwback too, because it's like. Um, this is pre. This is pre Family Matters, right? Mm -hmm. um, this got him Family Matters, surprisingly, because he played a cop on that too. What 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 year was that? What year was Family Matters? Oh, uh, this was eighty seven. So I think Family Matters was almost immediately after that, eighty eight or eighty nine. Huge throughout the nineties, and I think that was on for like ten years. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's. That's crazy, but he's oh. great in this. Yeah, um, he's great as that that the lifeline, the guy who believes. Um, you get to at this point, and this is still in the, we're in the eighties, but um, this is uh, um, you know in twenty twenty four, watching the end of this film, and you know, spoiler alert: this is a fucking old movie. You guys get it. Um, you're watching this and he, he, he has this backstory that he couldn't fire his weapon. And, um, and then now at the end of this, he fires it and it's like, okay, here we are in this film in 2024, cheering a fucking cop who was fucking shooting someone. Um, <laughs> and the cop that. is black. Um, <laughs> I remember that cause it was, it was weird because the story is that, uh, he shot a kid, a uh, 13 year old kid in the dark. He had a ray gun. It looked real enough, you know? And I mean, it, it's all plausible and how it would fuck with you and it would humanize. Of it is. Yeah, it, would, it, it humanizes the character where you can understand it. But there was always a part of me, even, even back then, middle school, that I was watching this film, starting high school, where I said to myself, Oh well, he's all better now. He can, now he's back to killing. Good for him. <laughs> now I can put <laughs> good old LAPD. <laughs> it's a few years yeah. before Rodney King, yeah. so um, yeah, that's right. It's yeah. uh, you know, there, there's, uh, the danger wasn't there. At least we didn't think. <laughs> I, I love yeah, it's that. Just weird the perspective on it, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, you can't watch it without at least recognizing that as a as a function of 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 the times, you know? Right. <laughs> um, the, the dark humor, uh, the, um, the FBI humor in the script. Mm -hmm. Um, they're both named one is black. Um, one isn't, and, uh, they're both named Johnson mm -hmm. and it's kind of like, you know, agent Johnson, agent Johnson, mm -hmm. no relation. <laughs> um, both of them are dicks. The, Johnson is a dick. Both so. of them are fucking, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they're in the helicopter doing this fucking crazy move where they're going to shoot all these people. And they, they estimate 20% of the hostages will be killed. I can live with those odds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just completely like offhand. It just thrown out that it's a throwaway line, yeah. but it's just like this dark humor that, yeah. um, it's not all like ha 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 ha, but it's this tone. Well, this it's, a, it's a realistic tone. Fucking, yeah, that's right. It's that um, macho because because if you remember, Robert Davi says, just just like Vietnam. Remember sport? And he was like, I was in middle school, asshole. Right. So it's like they're already referencing, and 
it's hard to watch it's hard to watch a helicopter scene without thinking of apocalypse you know regardless of of the philippines versus century city that's still a helicopter flying above shooting people and uh that's the kind of shit that immediately jumps to mind at least for me it does yeah i mean it's weird when you think about shit like that because <laughs> it's it this is again it's um we're also in that mood and those of you listening will understand why in a few episodes but um we're in this mood of like looking back and i mean not that we haven't been before because i mean like how much of this is about looking back because you're watching just the fact the act of watching a film and then talking about it after is uh, is looking back mm-hmm. right it's um um but old films childhood fucking your past your your relationship to these films but also again going back to like not only the video store and you know, those old channels but but cinema history you know i'm thinking fucking not only a helicopter to me is not only like flight of the valkyries apocalypse now mm-hmm. helicopter to me is also fucking like a stunt gone wrong oh yeah you know what i mean and that played into um, this too because that was 83 the landis yeah. thing was 83 this is John 87 landis. 88 yeah yeah um so it's kind of like at that point every time someone gets into a helicopter it's kind of like well we need to make sure we need to do this we need to do that you know what i mean because it's still fresh enough um it's and those things do come around you know what i mean like uh it's kind of like now you see a gun or you see a gun fired in a movie, you know, maybe, maybe you think about it. Maybe you don't, maybe, you know, the Alec Baldwin thing comes up, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And, um, um, that I saw the other day, I saw the trailer for the crow, yeah. the, the new version. I was going to ask you about that. Um, yeah. Don't, um, <laughs> now I got to <laughs> <laughs> ask an answer. Um, <laughs> And uh, elaboration needed, <laughs> <laughs> but I saw it in the, I, the first thing I thought about was was uh, was Brandon Lee's death. Yeah, because I just it's like because the crow is Brand, is right there with Brandon Lee's death, and then next to that is Stone Temple Pilots on one side, and then now I'm thinking Alec Baldwin because uh, it's another death on the set. You know what I mean? It's like all these this web of like shit that may not be directly connected, but it's connected in terms of the fucking. Uh, the way my brain works and and these cinematic like things you know what i mean and and not only on the screen but off screen or on set um so and then and 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 we can't get around you know watching uh we watch this film die hard and then you're thinking about bruce willis's fucking health you know what i mean and like um what's become of him and and there are still articles you know that are coming out as we speak talking about the state of his health and the other day i saw um and this isn't even something that i i think this is just the fucking algorithm just kind of like saying like oh you watched you watched this recently here um it was something about um bruce willis's family potentially bracing for this holiday season to be his his last um, because he's got that version of dementia and, um, he has, he suffers from aphasia, which is, um, or an impairment of speech, mm-hmm. um, to where he can't, he can't speak anymore. Um, and it's when you have, it's kind of like Ali, um, mm-hmm. Muhammad Ali was, uh, but, you know, all these things that Muhammad Ali wasn't connected to those was his quick wit, mm-hmm. his um, his gift of gab, right? His blarney. Um, someone like Bruce Willis, especially like Bruce Willis in this, it's kind of like he had the cockiness. He had that, uh, 
he had that smart ass humor. He always had some little comment to say. And and then you think about what happened with Ali and and um, his 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 de- his decline in terms of his health. Yeah. You think about Bruce Willis, his decline, and it's like the guy who we think of us having these smart ass answers now cannot speak. You know, it's it's um Ali holds a special place in your heart and that's where you go with it. Um I just finished reading a biography of the early years of Richard Pryor. There you go. <clears throat> and that's, that's where I, I go with it. Yeah. yeah. So you and, and the point is where you have these you have these great bullshitters, you have these great these great wordsmiths who were who were able to be quick witted and and um amaze you with the way their minds would 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 take in information and then comment on the state of of the world of politics of relations of race relations uh, uh man woman relationships all the, the the to know that these people can no longer communicate in the way they once did it's sad because there's, you, you have to wonder what is the deterioration of the mind because I always thought the saddest thing about about especially Pryor and um, Ali was everybody said the intelligence was still there they just couldn't articulate anymore which I think for guys like that would slowly drive them crazy so like you know it, you know when you in the way that a prisoner loses his capacity to relate to other people in the outside world i imagine if you're if you're imprisoned in parkinson's or um ms or aphasia that would be a lot of what it is where you can no longer communicate with people um it's scary it's sad and when you watch these movies, when you watch these, when you watch footage of these people in their prime, I was listening to Richard Pryor. I was, I was listening to, is it something I said the other night? And I was just blown away at how on point he was on a lot of things. And I mean, that point can be argued by a lot of people on, on, on Richard Pryor's, um, um, perspective. You could say the same thing about uh, about Ali you, and and um, Bruce Willis in these films, but there was a um, there was a gift there in being able to create these characters and imbue them with with a certain level of of humanity that draws you into the stories. I mean, there's a reason that. 30 plus years later, people are still watching Die Hard. And um, there's a reason that we're doing an episode on it. There's a reason that it's not, it's, it's not simply nostalgia. Nostalgia is a big part of what we do and remembering these movies. But it's also, it's also the power of that image and the power of that characterization in connecting with um with human emotions and yeah you can write this off as just a dumb action film which in a way it is but there are moments what what's great about this film is it's not afraid to take time out from the action to develop the characters and the relationships so you understand It's not just a damsel in distress story. Bonnie Bedelia really has a lot to do in this movie. I mean, she's taken over for her boss. She's she's commenting on what's going on. She's the go between between um, between the hostages and Alan Rickman, and she really she really um, delivers. It would have been very easy to just been the put upon wife who yeah. realizes that she, that, that her marriage has gone to shit and that she, she really loves her man. There's a lot more to it than, than that. And I think she, I, I really do think that she takes a stock character with, even with the little bit of time that she has on screen, 
she takes a stock character and she builds it from the ground up where where it's um it's more than just a simple damsel in distress performance i think she's great in it and she does use what's already there in a way that um because i mean the script built into the into the story itself is the fact that she's um she's like such a go-getter and Mm -hmm. and she's doing what she has to do that she will use her maiden name to further her own career Mm -hmm. um to the annoyance of her husband um um but that's that's maybe nowadays that's not you know that's not who cares right well, but in 87 um, it would have been a lot in 80 uh, yeah. yeah right it's a, you gotta it's watch it in the context thing. of the times yeah you right have to. and so it makes it makes it's kind of like oh wow like this um she's she it's it's a character who very much knows about the optics mm-hmm. um and is very aware of how she is perceived and how she will be perceived and that uh, also uh allows her to to deal with uh, alan rickman's character of gruber um and to even even that setup allows you to, to think like fuck she must be um a lot more f- afraid than she's even willing to show because she's she's got these layers mm-hmm. she's not just like as you said the put upon wife the the hostage wife the damsel in distress um in so many ways this the characters in this film are um like real human beings in that they're they're wearing masks they're presenting these different sides to them we get to see it in the film we get to see we know that that john mcclain is like we know that he's a good person that shit bothers him that etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm-hmm. even though he acts like it doesn't even though this even though that um we know that um alan rickman is probably his character is probably um more nervous than he appears but we understand and it's through the performances the direction added on top of the script and i mean it sounds like i'm projecting all this shit onto it and i am but this is also me i'm I'm looking at it and i'm thinking about these characters and it's and uh, i'm perceiving it as i watch the film everyone's acting more tough than they are yeah. whether it's the boss cop whether it's the fbi whether it's um the the bad guys are actually emotional they're just reacting mm-hmm. um with the exception of 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 gruber everyone else is kind of acting like they have it together including that douchebag fucking yuppie 80s cocaine businessman guy who's like nah don't worry like <laughs> here let's do this come on um He's putting up his cocaine fueled front too, yeah. and he get, and he gets him killed. Um, which no one is complaining about that in the film because it's like, well, that's protecting Bonnie at that point. Yeah. Um, and going back to her, it's kind of like that's why by the time that you get to the end of the film, and she punches the reporter, um, she's the one that gets that that moment. Yeah. Um, and it, it and it's worth it because of the reporter's um, behavior and his actions. Um, so it's 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 interesting that built into a film that, by its very nature of being an action film, is going back to what we said earlier has that that uh, element of unbelievable and stupid, but still, as you said has to be not necessarily realistic but still believable it has a a believability in terms of of character um Mm -hmm. and relationship and performance and care and relationship to oneself in terms of like how many action films where do you see where you you can see that there's potentially like layers to the character not very many it's mostly just this is this character is good 
this character is evil. Um, you know, luckily we get the, still the, the most, the most nuance that we get for female characters in action is like, okay, because it's a female character, we're going to get the broad strokes of, which is still something. Sigourney Weaver, tough, but also emotional, mm -hmm. still vulnerable, but strong. Um, which, but do you get that with men? Um, well, that's, not that's, necessarily. That's what's so good about Bruce Willis is that he's willing to put it on the line with it. There are moments where he's crying, where he's, and it's not just the pain of pulling glass out right, of his feet. Right, that's the symbolism of it. Yeah, yeah. right. There's, there's him telling, tell my wife, it's really easy to say, I love you. Right. But for him and, to actually say, yeah. she, she's heard me say, I love you a thousand times. She's never heard me say, I'm sorry. I love that moment. It's genuine and it's earned and it's believable within the context of the story and the character. Um, they look like a married couple. They really do look like they have a history. I think they work beautifully together. And and Reginald Bell Johnson is kind of like the the he's the surrogate for the audience at that yeah. point because he's he's you're basically hearing in this hostage crisis situation um, in film in the eighties kind of like an excuse for men who aren't drinking to express oneself express themselves emotionally to one another yeah because it's in a crisis and it's acceptable um and and they're not drunk because then it's like okay well we're drunk so we're in our cups so now we can you know i love you man you know like it's not that no. um and yes it's beyond the 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 vulnerability of like um I have no shoes on, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't have my work boots. I don't have my cowboy boots. I don't have my combat boots. I don't have any kind of boots. I'm barefoot running over glass. Um, how much more vulnerable can I be? And I'm pulling shards of glass out of my feet. But at the same time, I'm fucking saying, think, think. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to myself out mm -hmm. loud. Like, thank you, fucking asshole. How do I get out of this? And he does um, that throughout. Yeah. Yeah. And he's he wants, like you said in the beginning, he... He wants so badly to be rescued, too, because he wants the cops to just come in and do it. Yeah. Um, but but at the same time, he turns it on and he's like, oh, I, you know, Roy Rogers. And I'm lighting, lighting cigarette after cigarette after cigarette, um, which is also, you know, that's that's gone, too. You know what I mean? It's um, like, I can't help but think, <laughs> what if they had asked him, what are you, you going to do? And he said, I'm going to save the fucking day. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, completely out of character, completely right. wrong. You know right. what I mean? But <laughs> it's yeah, a different that stupid would be movie. Bruce Willis said it's cages. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, I love that the character, whatever you want to say about Bruce Willis, he's he was unafraid of the vulnerability. When he's standing on that ledge, he he knows there's going to be an explosion behind him. He knows he has no choice to get off that building but to jump. And what does he say? He says, oh, God, please don't let me die. I don't know of another film where you've actually heard a character say something like that. Stallone wouldn't have said that. Schwarzenegger never would have said that. No. You know? They are just, fuck it, let's go, let's do this shit. But but yeah, he's uh, John McClane is afraid to die. He wants to live. He wants to, you know, he wants to see his kids and he wants to see his wife and he wants to he wants to tell her he's sorry. I, I he's the most human action character that I've seen in films. He's um he's a smartass with a quip. He's uh, stubborn, bullheaded, um, and I, I gotta say this. He maintained that throughout the series. As ridiculous as the film got, he was always very honest to the character. The character mm -hmm. stayed honest, even by the, even by how um, out of whack the stunts got by the by the fourth film. I still believed in the John McClane character, and that's a that's a testament to how good Bruce Willis is in this film he brings it i mean he brings that into 
look at his performance in Pulp Fiction. Yeah. He brings that. It's it's um, he has that girlfriend with the fucking blueberry pancakes, and you're just like, um, like she's so fucking annoying. <laughs> um, and See, I think and she's the cute. <laughs> so it's like... I mean, she is sure, but it's kind of like it's there's more than just cute there you know what i mean it's yeah. fucking annoying um and the this element of doubt but he still has to go back he has to get that fucking watch it was his mm-hmm. father's watch you know right yeah. um we know the story um and he he brings with him this uh, this sense of fucking um, of a vulnerability, of a um, of potential doom. Yeah. Um, going back to the apartment, there's someone in your fucking house. Um, Boom! The 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 uh, the toast. Going back, you know, he, he he's give me a pack of red apples or whatever it is. And then it's talking with Marcellus, and it's like that's pride, you know, it's pride fucking with you, fuck pride, right? He he does it anyway, and you get that, and you're like, that's there's John McClane there too. Mm-hmm. Um, there's fucking John McLean saving Marcellus Wallace's ass, literally. A little bit too um, late, but yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, saving the remains of it, you know, and and um, and not talking about it, and. Then getting on that fucking bike, you know, whose chopper is this? It's Zed's. Who's Zed? Zed's dead. And riding off into the sunset. Um, that's. That's. That doesn't come. That doesn't exist in a vacuum. That's. That's Bruce Willis. But that's also a little bit of John McClane. Yeah. Well, that's the kind of thing where you, when you look at an actor's trajectory, you look at the filmography, you have to ask yourself, how does one role um, bleed? Yeah, bleed into another role. Um, and you see it. I mean, he, he plays, I don't know how many times I've ever seen, because he, he started making really shitty uh, straight to video films. He started, re- I, but I don't remember him playing a truly. Um, Uh, a villainous character. I don't remember him. The closest I think I, I've seen him play a villain was um, he did a movie with Paul Newman called Nobody's Fool, which I want to do one day. But you're gonna, I can, I can hear your fucking eyeballs rolling right now with the old man shit because that's what it is. It's an old man movie. Um, but he plays a man who. Who has a who has a relationship with Paul Newman, and um, he's a he's a successful businessman in this small town, but he's a drunk and he's a he's a womanizer, and he's an asshole and treats his wife badly, and he's at odds with um, Paul Newman's character, but it's the closest I've ever seen him to playing the villain. I can't think of another movie where he was a villain. He was in um he was in a movie with with Richard Gere. And it was called The Jackal. You didn't see that? Oh, we played Carlos the yeah. He was What's a that? he was a an assassin. Yeah. But they didn't paint him as a true villain, did they? They they, they painted him with uh I don't remember. I don't remember I've never seen the movie. I, don't know, I know it's it's him, Sidney Poitier, right? I think he's in that, right? I think he is. I remember it's it's 
I might be mixing now because I um I'm starting to um uh I'm getting Antonio Banderas, but that's a different movie. Um, Antonio Banderas would have been um, Assassins with, with Assassins, Stallone. yeah. Um, that's different, mm -hmm. but um, but I know he was. It was him and Richard Gere, mm -hmm. and one of them is basically on the mission to go after the other one. Um, and I think, I mean, even in Hudson Hawk, he's kind of like, <clears throat> he's villainous. Um, well, he's the robber, but he's, he's, he's like Robin the Robin from, from this. Yeah. He's robbing from worse people, you know? Um, other than that, I don't, um, I mean, late nineties Armageddon hero, mm -hmm. um, Six cents, okay. Um, that whole thing. The well, I can't even remember what else. Sin City, um, definitely a hero in Sin City. And I don't remember anything else that I, I can't think of something in terms of Bruce Willis post Sin City that I'm like, oh, this is I, this has my uh kind of like has my imagination or has a, an image for me of Bruce Willis after that. That's, that's gotta be, I mean, that's 2000 watts in city. Oh, that's, Early 2000s. Yeah, probably. Um, I don't know what else he's been in. I can't think. A few years ago, I know he was in that surrogates film. It was like, People are hooked up to some kind of like uh, VR, virtual mm -hmm. reality thing, and they use, um, they stay home and their surrogate goes out and exists in the world for them. Um, but he was a hero in that. Um, and that wasn't that recently either. That was like, oh, that was like at 12, least 12, 13 years ago. ago yeah. Um, I can't, and Looper, okay, there was that. Um, but he's um, he's sympathetic in that he's not a he's not a bad guy. So yeah, he's right. He's um, I'm talking about a pure villain. I I can't think of that. No, mm -mm. I don't know if I don't know if the studios would have sold him as a pure villain. I don't know if I mean I think he probably could have done it, but I don't think I don't think the the studios would have ever backed um backed that kind of a play. He was too heroic. He was too. Uh, People loved him too much, and I think they still do. I, and you know, and and with the uh, with the diagnosis, it's even it's even worse now. I mean, he played characters that you could see. He played the hero. Like if you watch the Last Boy Scout, he's not necessarily a likable character, but he is the hero. It'd be interesting for you to watch it because that is a that is a film of Tony Scott excess. It's fun. It's a lot of fun, but it's, um, it's violent as all fuck. And it's, um, it's got a, it's got a weird kind of nineties edge. You know, you know, another thing that surprised me about watching this film is that it is an R rated film. It is an R rated film and it doesn't shy away from that. He says, fuck a lot in this movie. Did you notice that? I mean, seriously, I, I don't he did. Think so. I, he didn't. I don't think so. I, I, I don't remember an excessive amount of, of fucks. Um, and I don't remember being saying, well, I'm, to not myself, saying oh, he's I'm, I'm not saying excessive to the way you talk. No, I <laughs> or know the way that. I talk. I fucking know but... that. Fuck. <laughs> Um, no, I'm saying I, I didn't, I just didn't, um, I guess it just, it was just, well, it sounded normal. You it's, know what it's I mean? weird. Like, um, yeah, it does sound normal because that's the way people talk. I think when you see films, because, because the ratings board only allows a certain number of fucks in, um, in a, in a film, I think you can get what you can get away with one fuck. You can't get away with motherfucker. 
Um, and you can't use fuck in as a verb. So, um, to fuck. Yeah, you can't, well, or, you know, uh, they were fucking or you to can't. fuck. Or you can't use it as, right. a, as yeah. an act. You can't use the act right. of fucking. Um, so, but he, he says, you know, do you, th- you know, what the fuck do you think, lady? I'm, do you think I'm ordering a fucking pizza or, or, or come on with you fucking assholes? I mean, he, he says fuck a lot in this movie. Um, compared to so today where they, where they will cut it out. Even in the last film, not the not the fifth film, but the fourth film, when he's when he says "Yippee Kaye, motherfucker," he says "Yippee Kaye, mother," and the gun blast covers up the fuck. Mm. And I thought, which which pissed off a lot of people. Yeah, they they felt that it betrayed, and I think it does betray the film, um, because you want to hear him say it. "Yippee Kaye, motherfucker" is is an iconic line. Yeah, I mean it's one of those mm-hmm. cinema lines, yeah. um, and it's and it's and it goes back to the um, the criticism is uh, especially of American um, American films and like ratings board and like what we talked about with that mm-hmm. is, is like what's covering up the word? It's the fucking gunshot, yeah. and it's kind of like okay, so mm-hmm. you favor violence over uh, over over foul so called foul language. Um, and that's, I mean, it makes complete um, sense that American culture would be that distorted. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, that's interesting. You're saying you get a certain amount of fucks that you can say, mm-hmm. and then it's no longer R, it goes into NC-17. No, I'm not even saying that. I'm saying that they wouldn't, that the studio, the studio won't even allow it to get to that place. That they would just right. cut out all the well, Otherwise it would. Yeah. Right? That's what you're saying? Okay. Otherwise, yeah. They, they would have to, um, it's one of those situations where you, they wouldn't even test it. So I don't know. I mean, um, I think, I think if I'm not mistaken, Kevin Smith, Kevin Smith had to fight an X rating either for chasing Amy or dogma because of the excessive use of language. And I think it was in that documentary that we watched about the rating system where he fought it and he won. Um, but it's like, yeah, language. It's ridiculous how the way people, if, if this is the way people talk in real life, why do we need to be protected from it? in a movie and their ideas is well their idea is we won't allow um no 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 you could say fuck a number of times the problem is it will get you out of the pg pg 13 into the r and an r cuts back the 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 box office because i remember i remember seeing my mom and dad did not take me to see Die Hard. I went to see Die Hard. They sold me a ticket. And it's an R-rated Oh, they film. just let you go in on your own. <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, that's the way I remember it, at least. I, I don't, um, or it could have been one of the movies that I snuck into, but I think, I think I paid for Die could Hard. Be. Could be. I mean, I, all that shit is a blur. I saw so many movies. You were probably, what, 13? Time. Yeah, 12 or 13, probably. Yeah, because it was a summer movie, and I would have been turning thirteen, so I would have been, I would have been twelve around that time. So what, eighty-seven? Yeah, seventy. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's just I mean, it's, it was just a different popcorn, time. You know? Yeah. Hey, I mean, it's not like the it's not growing up with with my asshole dad. It's not the first time that I heard fuck. You know. I wasn't. Yeah, it, I mean, like this is the eighties. This yeah. is this is. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of like, um, on one hand, like certain forms of wannabe protectionism, including like the war on drugs, just say no, but at the same time, it's like, but after school, you're on your own asshole. <laughs> yeah. Figure it you out. Know what I mean, like, yeah, whatever yeah, danger is out keys. there, deal with it. Yeah. There are your keys. Mm-hmm. Um, Everything else is kind of like, you know, beware of the fucking noid. 
when you call dominoes, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's it. Fucking like, don't get fucking, don't, don't get molested. Um, don't end up on a milk carton. Yeah. Good luck. And that's, that was that's the 80s. fucking the eighties. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> so John McClain, yeah. Bruce Willis. Um, it's sad, but but we have the we have the legacy. We have the films. We yeah. have the performances. We have the lines. We have it all there for us, laid out. Yeah. Um, whatever happens um, with him, I mean, obviously we're all fucking going to the same. I mean, I don't know that we're all going to the same place if that place exists or not whatever that's a different story but the you know jim morrison it's no one no one here gets out alive you know what i mean like so um, absolutely it's great to have left how many can say that they've left that legacy he does he has it and it'll live on and uh this character will live on and you know even when they remake this and reboot it or whatever the fuck they're gonna do with it because you know you know that's in the pipeline. There are people talking about it. You, I mean, just think about who how would many, do it. Who would do it? Not who would do it, but who? Not who would do it, but who? Who would they cast? I don't think there's an actor working today that you can imagine taking over that. Of course, but who would they cast? Ryan Gosling. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay, that's. I mean, that's an interest. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. I think so. I mean, this... Story, and I think he would do an interesting job. And yeah. I think he could play that kind of like smirking... His smirking version of of that smirking character. Um, I don't have a problem but, with them remaking a version of this story. Just don't make it John McClane. Make it somebody else. Make it something... I mean, when this came out, think about how many films mirrored this Cliffhanger, Die Hard on a Mountain. Passenger 57, Die Hard in an Airplane. Um, Good point. Speed, Speed, Die Hard on a Bus. On a Bus, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and that was shot by the same guy who shot this. John de bon, Jean de Bont directed Speed. He was the cinematographer on this film. I mean, not to mention the four different versions of, of you know, uh, uh, Die Hard 2, Die Hard in an airport, Die Hard with a vengeance, with uh, Die Hard running through the streets of, of New York. I mean, it, you know, the basic, the basic concept of the story is a good one. It, in fact, it's a pretty great one. Um, I don't mind them remaking a version of this story. Just don't bring back... Who can play Indiana Jones? Who can play John McClane? Who can play, you know, Rocky? Who can play uh, uh, the Terminator? No one. Those characters are those actors. They live within our hearts and our minds. Find somebody new to tell a different version of that story. You don't have yeah, to. You, have to tell yeah. you don't have to. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to depend on the bankability of an old property. And our memories of it. I mean, and and Bruce Willis fucking was guilty of that with fucking Last Man Standing. I don't know if you saw that piece of shit. It's a piece that of was shit. A, a, but that's a, that's more that of a was, Walter Hill problem than anything. His version of Yojimbo. Mom, his version of Yojimbo, which is a version, with, and 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 Sergio Leone's version of Yojimbo versus Dashiell Hammett's original Red Harvest. I mean, there's, you know, it's there's so many different ways. Property. Yeah, it's an old property. But when you adhere too closely, at the very least, he tried to put it in a different setting and... Yes. You know, yeah, it's, it's... It just wasn't really well with done. With a fedora, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's Clint Eastwood with a fedora. Yeah. It's fucking... Um, it's uh, Kurosawa with a fucking Tommy gun, you know? Yeah. Some shit ain't gonna work. But 
at least we this does. Here. Yeah, this does. Yep. This absolutely does. I'm I'm so glad that the that the little caffeinated nicotine addicted Ibrahim Chavez <laughs> loved this. <laughs> I just amused my. I amused the fuck out of myself with that image today. <laughs> I could see you sitting there just. <sighs> That's right. I loved it. I, it was magic for me. But I'm glad you. I'm glad that you loved it. I'm glad you. I'm glad you had a good time with it. Not loved, but had a good time with it. I did. Um, <laughs> caffeinated, you know, slick, not so slick, obvious transition. Um, shameless. Buymeacoffee.com slash watch Rick Ramos. That's buymeacoffee.com slash watch Rick Ramos. Today's episode goes to Jeremiah. Thank you. Keep us caffeinated. Keep us talking. Stay listening. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfuckers. <laughs> Yippee-ki-yay, motherfuckers. <laughs>